Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Ty Jager. I teach creative writing in the English department. And I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight for an evening with Trenton Lee Stewart. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the Hendrix Murphy programs um, for all the initiatives and programs that they bring to this campus, including uh, the Murphy Scholars Program and this evening's um, reading with Trenton Lee Stewart. And of course, um, this reading is part of a, a larger program that Trenton is involved with. Um, he is actually the Hendrix Murphy um, Visiting Writer in Residence. And I see a number of people who are in his class writing and publishing fiction. So thank you all for coming out. Um, Trent's going to read for us tonight. And then we'll have a Q&A. That will be followed by a book signing and a reception out in the lobby. Um, about a month ago, I sat down with Trent, and we were eating $1.50 tacos, a plate full of $1.50 tacos. It was Trent's treat. Um, <clears throat> and we were talking about um, being in writing classrooms, both as students and as teachers. And one of the things that came out of our conversation was how valuable it is to have, after having left a writing classroom, having developed relationships with other writers where you find people who you have friendships with, but those are also literary friendships, so people you trust as readers. Um, and as we were having this conversation, Trent mentioned his friend Mark Barr, um, he, who you may know is that red-headed stranger that accompanies Dr. McKim at events such as this. And so Mark and Trent um, were both English majors, graduated from Hendrix in 92, and that friendship they developed at Hendrix has grown into um, great friendship, but also has involved them exchanging work for like decades, four, five decades. So as I was thinking about giving the introduction tonight, it occurred to me that rather than listening to me talk, which we grow bored with very quickly, um, I thought it would be a, a great pleasure for you all to have Mark Barr introduce Trenton Lee Stewart. So if you would please welcome Mark Barr. Good evening, and uh, thanks, Ty, for this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> I'll be honest, this might not go well. Uh, <laughs> Trent Stewart is my dear, dear friend, and has been since we met during our first year together at Hendrix. Um, like Ty said, we both majored in English, studied writing, um, and pretty much enjoyed a series of misadventures, which has given, risen to, uh, given rise to a lifelong friendship. So when, when Ty approached me about introducing Trent, I didn't hesitate. I mean, who wouldn't want an opportunity to talk about someone they respect and admire, uh, someone who's one of their best friends? <clears throat> but once I got started, I found that it's, uh, it's kind of hard to talk about the qualities of a great friendship, about closeness and respect and admiration, without intensely feeling those emotions in a way that kind of overwhelms me. <clears throat> I mean, there's nothing wrong with crying. Uh, but it does make it difficult to coherently um, deliver prepared notes. And, uh, and this was happening when I was at home reading it to myself, let alone in front of an audience. Um, I mean, Trent and I had lunch yesterday, and I got choked up telling him about how I was getting choked up. <clears throat> so I'm not overly optimistic. We'll see how this goes. As I, as I prepared this introduction, I couldn't help doing uh, the uncomfortable bit of math uh, and realized that more years have passed since Trent and I were students here, likely than many of the students here were, uh, have been alive. Uh, so bearing that in, in mind, I wanted to uh, illuminate how long before Trent Stewart became the successful author he is today, he was once a young person. <laughs> Not so different from many people here tonight. <clears throat> and with that in mind, I have a story. It's a silly story, uh, but whenever Trent and I got together, I knew there would be laughing and jokes and oftentimes stupid stunts. 
Um, in, our, in our first year at Hendrix, Trent and I shared a class in Fawcett Hall. And as you exit Fawcett Hall, I don't know if you've been there, out of the classroom wing, the hallway kind of leads straight to this door. And beyond the door, there's a stairwell. And one afternoon, one of us, I'm, I'm fairly certain it was me, suggested, wouldn't it be fun to run down this hall and burst through that door and kind of mount up onto the banister and just leap? Uh, I mean, the fall's not suicidal or anything. It's like maybe six, seven feet. Um, I went and looked at it on my way over, and I really, it was impressive, I think, in hindsight. Um, but there were obstacles. There was a prickly hedge, and there's like five odd feet of sidewalk you've got to get past. But if you make it far enough, you can land in some grass. <clears throat> in hindsight, I, I really, it occurs to me, there's been something of a pattern in our friendship that sometimes I'll think of some foolish, ill-considered plot, usually as a joke, and Trent is the one who doubles down. He sort of takes up the mantle and says, yeah, let's do that. Like, yeah, let's jump down a flight of stairs, or yeah, let's try that water skiing stunt, or yeah, let's get into that freezing midwinter pool while on a school trip in Oxford, Mississippi, or yeah, let's commit a little light U.S. mail crime. <laughs> <laughs> so that day at Fossa, we did jump, and it banged us up a bit, but not too badly. Uh, but here's the life lesson, bodies age. Because uh, four years later, when we were seniors, we found ourselves again taking a class in front of Fawcett, and again heading out that exit, and we talked ourselves into repeating the stunt, and wow, did it hurt a lot worse. <laughs> and I don't think we'll be repeating it tonight. Um, after graduation, Trent moved to Iowa and attended the prestigious Iowa Writers' Workshop. Before class, the presenting writers um, set out photocopies of their stories, at least they did then. And on occasion, Trent grabbed an extra and mailed it to me. This is the part where I'll choke up. <clears throat> I was back in Little Rock working a day job, dreaming about writing and grad school and all that. So it was an act of great kindness. Um, sometimes there were essays that the professor wanted to share. And so one afternoon, I opened the envelope, and I found this thickly folded copy of this guy, Ted Solotorov's essay called Writing in the Cold, the First 10 Years. It's this terrific read if you're a young person who wants to write mostly because it paints such a dark, apocalyptic picture of how hard success will be that real life isn't that bad in comparison. Solotaroff makes the argument that talent is great to have, but writing is hard and durability is what's needed if you're gonna make it through what he calls the miserable trifecta of uncertainty, rejection, and disappointment. James Magnuson of UT Austin sums it up like this, bang around, stay alive, keep writing. Well, Trent Stewart was durable. He banged around. He stayed alive, and he kept writing. It shouldn't be news to anyone that it's kind of rare in writing that, uh, that it pays its own way. Uh, throughout history, there have been mail carriers, dog walkers, insurance clerks, all have been secret writers. And Trent joined in that tradition, working jobs as various as a night clerk at a hotel, overnight minder at a group home for men, checkout clerk at a library. Uh, in Iowa, and this was in the pre-Netflix days, uh, he worked for a video rental shop driving VHS cassettes to the store's locations around the state. More, more than once, I think he was stranded when the company car died. <clears throat> but throughout all this, he told me, this was the key, his criteria was always that a job give him time to write and as a bonus, give him an opportunity to read or at least listen to an audiobook. Bang around, stay alive, keep writing. Well, Trent's uh, tenacity and hard work has paid off. He's authored an impressive set of books. In 2005, he published Flood Summer, a beautiful book about loss and hope that's set here in Arkansas. And that was quickly followed by the New York Times bestselling Mysterious Benedict Society, which Kirkish Reviews praised for its uh, appealingly complex characters and rich moral and ethical issues. Benedict Society, of course, kicked off an entire series of books. Uh, most recently, he's published The Secret Keepers, which the New York Times called genuinely haunting and ingenious. Uh, another Benedict book is in the works. And, and excitingly, uh, Hulu will begin shooting a serialized adaptation of the first Benedict book this fall. Um, before I close, I wanted to add one more thing for the benefit of the students in the audience. Uh, my friendship with, uh, my relationship with Trent has been one of the defining friendships of my life. And it started here at Hendrix. Uh, Hendrix has changed a lot in the intervening years. I remember running into Trent on campus the day he first uh, found out that his, his, his first short story had been placed. Um, that building is no longer here. Uh, professors that were fresh out of grad school when we were uh, students have had full careers and retired. But Hendrix and what it was for me remains. Uh, the years being out in the world have only convinced me all the more that, that this is a special place. We think of college as this environment where you individually pursue your goals. 
But I'm here to prove that a person's education involves <clears throat> not only classrooms and teachers, but also the friends we make. Find your people, they're here. With that, I'll wrap up and I'll give you one of my people, my friend, a cherished son of Arkansas, Trenton Lee Stewart. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for showing up tonight, <clears throat> uh, including those of you who had to. And that was beautiful, Mark. Thank you. Uh, the temptation, as it always is with Mark, is to make jokes, because that's how we engage with one another. But it's hard to make a joke after that. So uh, I'm just honored and uh, honored to be here. I'm grateful to Hendricks College and the Murphy Foundation, the English Department, Ty. Um, Jager, in particular, my students. Uh, it's been a great experience to be back here so far. Um, so I'm happy to be here with you tonight. Mark made reference just now to that first short story that I placed, which I hadn't thought about in a while, until I was looking at, I think you all have it in your programs. I was just talking, Shelby, are you here? A student of mine who said she did some research and wrote that up. I saw the mention of the Pinehurst Journal as among the places where I've published my work. and. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this prestigious publication uh, that was put together with, I think, cardboard and staples back in the day uh, from somebody's basement, uh, it, it published not one but two of my stories back in the early days. And I remember I was paid the sum of five American dollars <laughs> for that first short story, which I will never forget. Um, so yes, I, I think what happens now is that I'm going to read from my work to you all, and then there will be the Q&A that um, Professor Jager mentioned. Um, so a couple of things before we get going. Um, two things that I never thought I would do. Um, one, the first and most relevant to you all probably, is I never thought that I would read from a middle grade adventure novel to a room full of adults. Um, but that is what's gonna happen tonight. Uh, so I've, I've dodged it for long enough, and now I'm finally going to do it, not just read part of something, but an entire chapter from a, from a book for children. Um, so if, for those of you who are coming tonight hoping to hear me read from my suite of tone poems, uh, I apologize. <laughs> and I don't, you can slip out now. I won't look up for a minute, shuffle my papers. I don't blame you. And a drink of water. I'm thinking children's book. Okay. I can't put this, excuse me. I'll do lots of sight gags like that the whole evening, just so you can <laughs> expect that. Pratt Falls. Um, okay, so you're still here. I'm gonna read from this, uh, this book, uh, and that is the, the other thing that I thought I would never do, um, I, hadn't, I thought I would not do for several years, was to return to the Mysterious Benedict Society series, um, and yet I finally did that. I got bitten by some kind of bug, and so I did return to that, and that's what I'm going to be reading from tonight. I think of it as a sequel to the threequel and the prequel. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Mysterious Benedict Society, uh, in short, it was about a group of four uh, differently gifted children who get pulled together, recruited essentially to go on a highly dangerous mission that only children can accomplish. And they use their very different gifts working together to solve these often usually riddle-like puzzles and various challenges. So uh, they got pulled together to go on that initial mission, and then and the subsequent two books were a continuation of their adventures. Um, but it has been several years since the Mysterious Benedict Society uh, has had anything written about them. And I was putting off for some years this idea that kept returning to me about writing about them when they were a little bit older. Um, and then finally one day, uh, it seemed like I could not resist that, and I wanted to write about them more and see how they turned out. So. Um, some years have passed since the last time we met these characters. Now, there is no cool way to read a children's book to a room full of adults. You understand that, I hope you understand. I'm going to treat you, there also, but the, the other side of the coin is, there is also no cool way as an adult in a room full of people to listen to a children's book. You can't be cool while this happens. Um, so I'm gonna treat you as my children and read this to you like a real bedtime, chapter from a middle grade adventure novel, 
And so I urge you to summon up your 11 or 12 year old that's inside you, or if you are 11 or 12 years old, to be yourself. Um, and uh, I'm gonna read this to you. It's sometimes my voice will change as characters arrive who are not the same age, et cetera, et cetera. I think you get the picture. Any questions? Okay. This is a work, of, it's not entirely finalized. The book is gonna come out in the fall. It's called The, the Mysterious Benedict Society and the Riddle of Ages. Um, and this is not yet the final draft. It's getting close, but there will be a suggestion box in the lobby that you can take advantage of if you have comments. Okay. Who's ready? Ready to go on this adventure? All right. Yes, I'm going to get a drink of water. I have to keep bending all the way down for that. Okay. Thank you again for coming, everybody. So I'm going to read the first chapter from this book. Um, and the first chapter is called Surprising Arrivals and Rooftop Reunions. That's just about uh, 60 pages. <laughs> You're fine. Okay. <laughs> In a city called Stonetown, on a quiet street of spacious old houses and gracious old trees, a young man named Rennie Muldoon Paramal was contemplating a door. The door, currently closed, belonged to his study on the third floor of one of those houses, in this case, a gray stoned edifice half covered in ivy, with a magnificent elm tree in its courtyard and surrounding the courtyard, an old iron fence quite overgrown with roses. From his study window, Rennie might easily have been looking out upon that tree or those flowers, or he might have lifted his gaze to the sky, which on this fine spring morning was a lovely shade of cobalt blue. Instead, he sat at his desk in an attitude of attention, staring at the door, wondering who in the world could be standing on the other side. For a stranger to be lurking in the hallway should have been impossible given the fact of locked doors, security codes, and a trustworthy guard, yet Rennie's ears had detected an unfamiliar tread. His ears were not particularly sharp. Indeed, his hearing, like almost everything else about him, was perfectly average. He had average brown eyes and hair, an average fair complexion, an average tendency to sing in the shower, and so on. But when it came to noticing things, noticing things, understanding things, and figuring things out, average could hardly describe him. He had been aware for the last 30 seconds or so of something different in the house. Preoccupied as he'd been with urgent matters, however, Rennie had given the signs little thought. The shriek and clang of the courtyard gate had raised no suspicions, for not a minute earlier he had spied Captain Plug, the diligent guard, leaving through that gate to make one of her rounds about the neighborhood. Hearing the sounds again after he'd turned from the window, Rennie had simply assumed the guard forgot something or was struck by need for the bathroom. The sudden draft in his study, which always accompanied the opening of the front door downstairs, he had naturally attributed to the return of Captain Plug as well. He had wondered vaguely at the absence of her heavy footsteps below, but his mind had quickly conjured an image of that powerfully built woman taking a seat near the entrance to remove something from her boot. Too quickly, Rennie realized when he heard that unfamiliar tread in the hallway, and now he sat staring at the door with a great intensity of focus. A knock sounded a light tentative tapping, and in an instant, Rennie's apprehension left him. There were people in Stonetown right now who would very much like to hurt him, but this, he could tell, was not one of them. Come in, said Rennie, his voice inquisitive. There was no reply. He glanced at his watch, then at the clock on the wall, and then at the two-way radio that sat silent for the moment on his cluttered desk. Come in, he called more forcefully. The doorknob rattled, slowly turned. And at last, the door swung open, revealing, as Rennie had by this point already deduced, a child. It seemed the most unlikely of developments, but the fact remained, the stranger was, of all things, a little boy. Well, hello, Rennie said to the boy, who stood grinning shyly with a hand on the doorknob, swinging the door back and forth. The boy's hair, very fine and black, was in a frightfully tangled state. His skin, of a light olive tone, was smudged here and there with a dark, oily substance, and stuck to various places on his shirt and trousers, both quite filthy, was the fur of at least two kinds of animal. But the boy's large eyes, so dark brown as to be almost black, were shining with excitement. I'm Ty, said the boy, still swinging the door back and forth. I'm five. Rennie feigned confusion. Wait, which is it? Are you Ty or are you five? The boy giggled. Both, he said, letting go of the doorknob and approaching Rennie's desk in a rush. He drew up short, resting his hands on the edge of the desk and his chin on the back of his hands. My name is Ty Lee, and I'm five years old. 
He said this without lifting his chin from his hands and thus with some difficulty. Oh, Rennie exclaimed with another glance at his watch. I think I understand now. Well, Ty, my name is Rennie Muldoon, the boy interrupted with a, inter with a delighted laugh. I know who you are. I have a name that starts with M too. My middle name does. I'm not going to tell you what it is, though. You have to guess. It isn't Muldoon, Rennie asked, quickly moving the radio, which Ty had noticed and reached for. No, said Ty, laughing again. Tell you what, Rennie said. I'll make more guesses later, and I'll let you touch the radio later too, okay? Right now it's important that we don't touch it. Right now we're expecting to hear from a friend. Ty gasped. Is it Kate Weatherall, the great Kate Weather Machine, who always carries around a red bucket full of tools? Rennie raised an eyebrow. Well, she used to, anyway. These days she's more of a utility belt and secret pockets kind of weather machine. A wistful expression crossed his face at this, like the shadow of a swiftly moving cloud. Rennie fixed the little boy with a curious gaze. You seem to know an awful lot about us, Ty. You saved the world, Ty whispered excitedly, as if he'd been bursting to let Rennie in on the secret but knew he wasn't supposed to. Oh, I wouldn't say the whole world, said Rennie with a skeptical look. And I assume you're talking not just about me, but also all of you, Ty whispered, the four of you, and Mr. Benedict and Rhonda and number two, and Milligan. Here the little boy frowned and consulted his fingers, counting off names in a whisper. He interrupted himself to scratch furiously at an itch on his arm, then began again. Hold that thought, Ty, said Rennie. And raising his voice, he said, Intercom, Sticky's office. A beep sounded from a speaker in the wall near the door, and Ty whirled to look. The speaker hung at an imperfect angle, with plaster peeling away all around it, and was speckled with ancient paint. It would not appear to be a functioning speaker. Nonetheless, its green indicator light flickered to life, and after a brief initial crackling sound, a young man's voice rang out. What's the word? said the voice, quite loudly and brusquely. Ty gave a little jump. He glanced at Rennie, then gawked at the speaker again. No word yet, Rennie replied. He cleared his throat. But say, George, were you aware that a five-year-old boy named Ty Lee has entered the house, evidently by himself, and is now standing here in my study with me? There was a pause, another crackle. Then, huh. <laughs> right, said Rennie, as if they had just discussed the matter at length. The timing is not exactly what one would wish. I'm guessing the timing has everything to do with it. Ty turned to Rennie with huge eyes. Is that sticky Washington, he whispered who's read everything and knows everything and never forgets anything, but gets nerp. That's him, all right, Rennie interrupted. Although lately he prefers his given name, George, and by the way, Ty, he can hear you even if you're whispering. Rennie wouldn't have thought the little boy's eyes could get any wider, but wider they got, and two small hands flew up to cover his mouth. They were very dirty hands, too. Rennie supposed now was not the moment to discuss hygiene. Hello, Ty, said the voice through the speaker. I look forward to meeting you. Ty made as if to clap his hands, then seemed to think better of it. He ran over to stand directly beneath the speaker. Hi, he shouted, gazing up at it. He stood on his tiptoes, trying to reach it with an outstretched finger. Rennie leaped from his desk. Let's not touch the speaker either, okay, Ty? It might fall off. Let me find something you can touch, how about? The speaker crackled. So, Rennie, would you say this matter needs immediate attention, or? <laughs> no, I've got it. I'm just keeping you in the loop. Roger that. Intercom off. Intercom off, echoed Rennie, and the green, light, green indicator light turned red. It turned red, Ty declared, so that means it's off. Right you are, said Rennie, casting about for something to give the little boy. Ty, seeing what he was up to, also looked around. The study in general was rather less cluttered and unruly than the desk, with less to offer his curious eye. Overstuffed bookshelves stood against every wall, an overstuffed chair stood in one corner, and behind the desk sat an antique chest covered with tidy stacks of paper, which Rennie now hastily began to clear away. One particular stack of papers, however, a thick bunch of envelopes, seemed to catch in Rennie's hands. Each envelope was addressed from one of the world's most prestigious universities. Most were still sealed, but the few letters that Rennie had read said almost exactly the same thing. Delighted to inform you, would be among the youngest ever to attend this university in its long, illustrious history, naturally covering your tuition, room, and board, along with a generous stipend for your expenses, an extremely rare honor. If you will please reply as soon as... The envelopes all bore postmarks from months ago. Rennie had yet to reply. 
He looked at the stack in his hands for a long moment, as he had done many times in recent weeks, before finally setting it aside. Meanwhile, as this clearing away of paper seemed to be taking a minute, Ty turned and spotted on the back of the door he had just entered a large map of the greater Stonetown area. Concentrated in the center of the map, in the heart of Stonetown itself were 13 pushpins. Ty counted them out loud, twice to be sure. Rennie, without looking, knew full well what Ty was counting, and as he felt beneath the lid of the locked chest for its two secret catches, he prepared himself for the inevitable question. Under normal circumstances, it would hardly seem wise to inform a young child that those pushpins represented 13 of the most dangerous men in the world, that those men, just as the location of the pushpins suggested, were now gathered right here in Stonetown, and that, Ty's, uh, that Rennie's sole purpose at present was to deal with them, which meant that the child, simply by being associated with Rennie, might be in great peril. Ty's presence in Rennie's study was a clear indicator that these were decidedly not normal circumstances, however. Perhaps given time, Rennie would sort out an appropriate answer. For now, he opted for distraction. Thirteen, Ty said, finishing his recount and turning to ask the question. Do you know what a baker's dozen is, Ty? Rennie asked before the boy could open his mouth. Ty knitted his brow, thinking. He scratched his chest, then holding his palms out in a very adult-like fashion, announced, well, you know, a dozen is 12, I know that. Rennie couldn't help smiling. He tapped his nose and pointed at Ty. That's right, and if you add just one more, some people call that a baker's dozen. Ty thought about this, making a great show of knitting his brow again. Then a look of understanding came into his eyes, and he laughed. You told me that because I was counting the pins, because there's 13. Right again, Rennie declared. He did not explain that the baker's dozen was the rather pleasant term that he and his friends used for some extremely unpleasant men, 11 of whom had just escaped from a supposedly escape-proof prison in Brig City. Nor did he explain that the breakout had been engineered by the remaining two men, who had never been captured in the first place, with the assistance of a mysterious figure whose identity was yet unknown. Rennie said none of these troubling things. Instead, he opened the antique chest and said, have you ever seen a kaleidoscope? By way of reply, Ty dashed toward Rennie, evidently stumbling over nothing at all, recovered his balance, and arrived at Rennie's side with face alight and hands outstretched. Can I hold it, he said, bouncing up and down on his toes. Can I look through it? Be very careful, Rennie said, placing the large kaleidoscope in the boy's hands. It's heavier than it looks. He felt Ty's small hands dutifully tighten their grip. Only then did he let go. Ty studied the kaleidoscope reverently before putting it to his eye, his other eye remained wide open, and directing it at Rennie's midsection. Wow, he breathed. This was on a submarine? Rennie blinked. You're thinking of a periscope. This is a kaleidoscope. It has colors. Try pointing it at the light. Without lowering the kaleidoscope, Ty turned his whole body around and craned his head upward. Oh, that's even better. Isn't it, though? Try closing your other eye. Ty tried ever so hard, but couldn't quite manage it. I'm still learning to wink, he said, half squinting in a way that gave him an air of great seriousness. He kept staring through the kaleidoscope, moving it slightly back and forth, and uttering quiet expressions of delight. Rennie felt an urge to tousle the little boy's hair. He resisted, however, because of the tangles and was instead about to pat Ty on the shoulder when the radio on his desk gave an extremely loud squawk. So sudden and so loud was the noise, in fact, that Ty dropped the kaleidoscope. Or rather, he did not drop the kaleidoscope so much as fling it up and away from him, and only by diving forward with hands outstretched and landing painfully on his belly did Rennie manage to catch it. For a moment, he remained in that position, emitting an involuntary moan of both pain and relief. Hooray, Ty cheered. You caught it. <laughs> he tumbled down onto the floor next to Rennie and lay with his face a few inches away. I'm sorry I dropped it, though, he whispered. And again, Rennie noticed how the little boy's dark eyes shone. He also noticed how badly Ty needed to brush his teeth. <laughs> That's okay, Rennie whispered back. I know you were trying to be careful. The radio squawked again. Rennie hauled himself to his feet. Ty followed suit, and together the two of them stood looking at the radio. Sometimes it takes a second or two, Ty whispered. I mean, Rennie whispered. He opened a drawer in his desk, took a pe peppermint from a tin, and handed it to Ty. Don't run or jump while you have that in your mouth, okay? Ty nodded happily, 
slipped the peppermint into his mouth, and went back to staring at the radio, which rewarded him with yet another squawk. This one was followed by the sound of a young woman's voice. Secret password, said the young woman. Are you there? Rennie adjusted a knob on the radio, pressed a button, and replied, Roger that. To Ty, he explained, secret password is our secret password. It's just a joke. Ty giggled. Confirming all clear, came the young woman's voice. Copy that, confirming now. Rennie released the button and hailed Sticky's office on the intercom. We have her, he called. How's the frequency? Checking, came the reply. And then, all clear, all clear, Rennie said into the radio. Well, great, said the young woman's voice. What's the word? Both major airports and all private airports compromised, still awaiting word from Grand Central. I got the word from Grand Central myself, also compromised. No, 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 Rennie muttered. Then, remembering Ty, who was following everything with riveted attention, he glanced down and explained, I'm just a bit frustrated, Ty. Everything's going to be fine. Oh, good, Ty said brightly. He made a loud sucking sound on the peppermint, which seemed to fill his whole mouth. After a long pause, during which Rennie made various private calculations, the radio squawked again, and the young woman's voice returned. This time, she sounded as if she was shouting in a windstorm. Stand by for ETA. That means estimated time of arrival, Rennie said to Ty, who nodded agreeably, though without evident sign of comprehension. We're not exactly sure where she is right now, Rennie went on, but my guess is that by tonight or tomorrow morning, wait, why did it sound so windy? I wondered that too, Ty said. Oh boy, Rennie whispered, just as the radio sounded again. ETA three minutes, shouted the young woman. Give or take 30 seconds. Going silent now, we'll update you shortly. The radio went quiet. Did you get all that, George? Rennie said as if into the air. I got it. Do you think it means what I think it means? I don't think it can mean anything else, do you? A long sigh issued from the intercom speaker. At least we won't have to wait long to see how this turns out. Ty tapped Rennie on the elbow. Why don't you just ask her what it means? Good question, Rennie said. Did you hear her say she was going silent? That means I couldn't get through to her even if I tried. We just have to, the radio squawked again. Hi again, shouted the young woman. She rattled off a string of data. ETA, two minutes. Meet me on the roof? Roger that, Rennie replied, shaking his head. What were those numbers and things, Ty asked. Coordinates and altitude, said the voice from the intercom, followed by another sigh. Here, Rennie said, removing the kaleidoscope lens and ushering Ty to the window. See, it's actually a spyglass, probably the best in the world. He handed the instrument to the astonished boy and showed him where to aim it. She's coming from the sky, Ty exclaimed. Evidently, Rennie murmured. He put a hand on Ty's shoulder. And that, my friend, pretty well sums up what you need to know about Kate Weatherall. Rennie returned to his desk, amused to hear the little boy repeating him in a whisper, pretty well sums up, but also troubled by something he had yet to lay a mental finger on. He began flipping rapidly through various piles of paper and folders on his desk. What was he forgetting, he wondered, and why did it matter? Is she going to land way over there, asked Ty, for Rennie had directed his aim to the northeast. The intercom speaker, with a crackle, explained that a projectile possesses both vertical and horizontal velocities, to which Ty responded by asking if those were real words. <laughs> She'll be coming in at an angle, Rennie muttered, and quite fast. Ty, meanwhile, had lowered the spyglass, which had grown heavy. When his thin arms had recovered, he raised it again and gasped. Far away against the backdrop of blue sky, he could see a figure falling. I see her, he squealed and started jumping up and down. Good job, Rennie said distractedly. He glanced over his shoulder. Hey, what did I say about jumping? Also, please be careful with that spyglass. It's actually Kate's. Ty had already stopped jumping anyway in order to hold the spyglass steady. The distant figure was now coming into focus. A young woman in a black flight suit plummeting at a steep angle, arms tight against her side, Yellow hair streamed like flames from the back of her visored helmet, which was fire engine red. There's a dot following her, Ty said. Oh, it's a bird. There's a bird following her. It's diving just like she is. Stooping, said the intercom speaker. Stooping? That bird is her peregrine falcon, Madge. When falcons dive like that, it's called stooping. ETA, one minute, Rennie. Shall we head up there or not? I'm thinking it might be better not to watch. Rennie snapped to attention, realizing what had made him uneasy. Stick, I mean George, he cried, fanning the pages of a bulky day planner. 
He found the page he wanted and jabbed his finger on an entry that read, Experiment 37B, Effects of Decreasing Atmospheric Pressure, etc. What is it? The intercom speaker asked. More trouble? Well, on the night of the evacuation, you were scheduled to run your chemical experiments on the rooftop patio, but then everything went haywire. I don't suppose you cleared... The answer to his unfinished question was the banging open of a distant door, followed by footsteps charging down a hallway. Rennie flew to the window. An elderly neighbor had emerged to work in her flower bed. A mail carrier was whistling down the sidewalk, depositing letters in mailboxes. The street was out of the question. It would have been a risky option anyway. Rennie jumped back to the radio. Hey, can you slow down at all? Copy that, came the reply. Only a little, though. She was doing this, Ty said from his place at the window. He clapped his hands to his sides, narrowly avoiding striking the spyglass on the windowsill. But now she's doing this. He threw his arms and legs out as if to do jumping jacks. Rennie was already hurrying from the study. That's great. Please be careful. I have to go to the roof now. Wait for me, Ty exclaimed, racing after him. Rennie ran pell-mell down the hallway, turning the corner just in time to see a large square section of the floor settling into place. He ran over to stand on it. Sticky's already up there, he said as Ty caught up. Hang on, this is a shortcut. He stomped the floor four times, then grabbed Ty by the shoulders to steady him. A trap door in the ceiling fell open, and suddenly, with a terrific rattling sound, they were racing upward. Ty, thrilled, shouted something Rennie couldn't make out. They passed through the trap door and kept going up and up through a gloomy attic filled with seemingly infinite contraptions and oddments scattered in all directions, through yet another trap door in the attic ceiling, and at last into fresh air. We're on the roof, Ty exclaimed. Yep, Rennie cried, leaping to an open instrument panel nearby. He threw a lever to secure the platform, then spun to face Ty. Promise me you'll stay right there. Ty looked utterly amazed to be asked. I promise, he said in a reverent tone, and clutched the spyglass to his chest. The rooftop patio, a flat expanse situated between two of the house's gables, was about half the size of a tennis court. Kate would have had little room for error under even the best of circumstances, and these were hardly those. Wind gusted fiercely from what seemed like every direction, sending scraps of paper dancing in the air like a wild mob of butterflies. Even worse, Rennie realized, those scraps were labels that had come loose from innumerable stoppered beakers arrayed on folding tables all across the patio. Every single one of those beakers, he knew, contained a different substance or mixture of substances, some of them quite dangerous. Rennie glanced at the sky to the northeast. His eyes detected what might have been a tiny insect hovering a few inches above him, but he knew it was actually a far-off Kate. She hadn't even pulled her parachute yet. He glanced at Ty to make sure he was staying put. Yes, the boy was rooted to his spot, safely out of Kate's line of approach, and staring past Rennie with an expression of excited fascination. That expression was more than warranted, Rennie knew. For moving frantically among the tables, snatching up beakers and placing them into a wicker basket was George Sticky Washington. The young man looked exactly as the young boy watching him had expected him to look, naturally slender and muscular. This was easy to determine as Sticky wore tank top shorts and flip flops, with light brown skin and a well-shaped, perfectly bald head. Ty had also expected Sticky to be wearing unusually stylish new spectacles, and sure enough he was. So stylish were the spectacles, in fact, and so well did they suit the young man's features that under different circumstances, Ty would have thought him an altogether dashing figure. Under the current circumstances, however, Sticky looked slightly ridiculous. His face was awash in panic and self-reproach. His feet shuffled awkwardly in their flimsy sandals, and his basket was beginning to overflow with beakers as if he were an overgrown, desperate child on some bizarre variety of Easter egg hunt. There's no time to clear all of them, Sticky shouted as he worked. I'm just getting the lethal ones. The lethal ones, echoed Rennie. He'd been thinking dangerous, which seemed more than sufficient. He glanced at the beakers on the nearest table. Only a few still had their labels. Two days of rain, and now this wind had done their damage. What can I do? I set it all up like a chessboard, Sticky yelled, shoving a stopper into a beaker. Eight tables, eight beakers per table. Got it, Rennie said, seeing the pattern. Each table represented a row on the chessboard, each beaker a space. So which ones? Without looking up from his work, Sticky shouted chess notation instructions. A2, D4, and C5, I've got the rest. A2, D4, and C5, Rennie repeated, already hustling to grab A2, a stoppered beaker in the first spot on the second row. It contained a liquid of an alarming vermilion color, which Rennie tried not to think about as he scrambled around to the fourth table. 
D4 contained a colorless liquid that looked like water but moved like sludge when Rennie picked up the speaker. He shuddered. Fortunately, this one was stoppered too. He ducked under the table and came up next to C5, an open beaker full of what looked to be harmless black pebbles. Uh, should there be a stopper for C5? Oh yes, believe me, you don't want those to spill. Use the one from C6, it's fine. Sticky shuffled past with his precariously full basket. This is all of them, he panted, his eyes swiveling skyward. He gave a yelp and doubled his pace. Rennie, here she is. Rennie, still shoving the stopper into the last beaker, didn't even have time to look up before he heard Kate's voice from shockingly close by. Get down, boys, I'm coming in hot. Rennie, clutching the beakers, dropped onto his back. In the next instant, his vision was filled with Kate Wetherall a parachute, a glimpse of sky, a falcon with wings outspread. And then the rooftop seemed to explode. Kate's boots, having cleared the first four tables, caught the fifth and sixth in quick succession. Two rows of beakers shattered in a fra fraction of a second. The air was suddenly filled with glass, powder, liquid, and Kate. And still she continued, crashing through the seventh and eighth tables, her parachute dragging behind her gathering wreckage. And still she crashed right across the end of the rooftop patio, through the low railing and out of sight. Her parachute full of debris dragged after her to the broken railing where it caught and held. Rennie sat up. He glanced at Sticky who was crouching with his basket in his arms and his jaw hanging slack. And then at Ty whose eyes seemed too huge for his head. He peered back across the rooftop patio. A purplish haze, not exactly smoke, shifted this way and that in the contradictory breezes. For a moment, the three of them stared at the parachute in shocked silence. And then they found themselves staring at two gloved hands, which had appeared from beyond the patio edge, clutching at the parachute silk. The hands were followed by a fire engine red helmet, and finally a figure in a black flight suit. Boots crunched on broken glass, gloved hands went up to remove the visored helmet, and there stood Kate Weatherall, grinning. Hi, boys, she said, brushing glass and splinters from her broad shoulders. She gestured at Ty, who's this little guy? Rennie and Sticky neither recovered enough to speak yet, exchanged a look. Ty, on the other hand, was bouncing up and down. I'm Ty, he squeaked excitedly. Rennie, let me hold your spyglass. I see that, said Kate, leveling an accusing look at Rennie before bursting into a laugh and striding forward to greet him. Rennie, who had long ago learned that Kate's greetings could be painfully enthusiastic, was quick to show her the beakers. We're holding dangerous chemicals, Kate, he said, climbing unsteadily to his feet. Why would you be doing that, Kate asked, laughing again. You boys need to be more careful. She gave him a peck on the cheek, then swooped over to Sticky, who flinched, to do the same. At the sight of Ty raising his own cheek expectantly, Kate put on a dubious look. Let's get you a bath first, mister. Have you seen your face? With a worried expression, Ty shook his head. Kate pretended to be shocked. What, never? You've never seen your own face? At this, Ty giggled, and with a quick, fine one kiss for the dust bunny, Kate swooped in and kissed him too. After Rennie and Sticky had very carefully put down their burdens, the three friends stood regarding one another. Despite having grown at different rates, they had all arrived, perhaps only temporarily, but still much to their amusement, at precisely the same height. Thus, Rennie's and Sticky's brown eyes were on the same level as Kate's familiar ocean blues. But that was not the reason they communicated so much and so easily without speaking. The three of them had been through more together as children than most people experience in a lifetime, and they had been best friends for years. So it was that everything they had just been through, not just over the years, but also in the last few days, everything that remained to be done, everything still at risk, these things and more passed among them without a word. Boy, am I hungry, said Kate, breaking the silence. She reached up to retie her ponytail. A sprinkle of debris fell from her hair and was carried off by the wind. Are we under imminent attack, or is there time for a sandwich? We don't think they're making a move today, Rennie said. They're holed up in different parts of the city awaiting some sort of message, most likely instructions from Mr. Curtin, though we don't know how they're going to manage that. And Mr. Benedict? He's safe at the moment, as long as he stays put. Super, said Kate. How about we have some lunch and catch up? I especially want to know how you, this she said to Ty, who stood in the middle of their little circle gazing up at their faces, came to be here. I want to know the same thing, said Sticky. By the way, Ty, it's nice to meet you in person. I'm, um, George, he said with some hesitation. For, his, for like his friends, Sticky still thought of himself as Sticky, despite his recent declaration to the contrary. 
He extended his hand, and Ty, beaming, shook it so energetically with his free hand that his other one almost dropped the spyglass. How did you come to be here anyway, Kate pressed, Ty, kneeling to be on eye level with him and reaching ever so subtly to take hold of the spyglass. Ty shrugged and scratched his chest. She told me how. She told me all about you, and she gave me directions, and she kept me company the whole time. Lowering his voice secretively, he added, even though I couldn't see her. Kate raised an eyebrow. Even though, oh boy, Sticky muttered. I wondered, said Rennie, nodding. I mean, I figured. That's right, called a strident voice from behind them. I told him, I brought him here. If not for me, he'd be in hot water right now, but I guess you're all having your happy reunion on the roof without me? You don't even send the platform back down? You make me take the stairs? By this point, everyone had turned toward the stairwell doorway, in the frame of which stood, with arms crossed and eyes flashing, a very angry-looking girl. Hi, Constance, sighed Kate. And just like that, the society was reconvened. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Trent, would you take some questions? I'd love to take some questions. My, my inner 11-year-old is, is right on the surface. I can see it. It turns out. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Hi. Um, so Obviously, you have a history of writing for both young adults and slightly older adults. Um, would you say that your writing process takes a different form based on you know, your intended audience? Uh, thanks for the question. I, I think so. Um, but they, have, they, just have, they have a lot in common. Um, I have mostly been writing for younger readers for, for several years now with only a few deviations. So it's hard to compare them as if I was doing both side by side. Um, but as far as I can remember, um, these books in particular came out of an interest in kids with different talents solving different kinds of riddle-like puzzles. And so there was a, there's a degree of, of a putting together a large puzzle with the plot that, and then wanting to make the kids real and have um, real personalities and complexities and so on. But it started with the puzzle concept as opposed to, um, I think, when I write when I've written for adults, it more often would start with uh, a character or a scene and then more of an exploration, uh, and I might figure out more as I went than I would, would do when I was writing these particular kinds of books. Does that answer your question, you think, reasonably well? There's lots of overlap, though, of course. I mean, the thinking about fleshing out characters and discovering things as you write the story that you didn't plan on ahead of time, a lot of those things are in common depending on the different kinds of, I mean, between the things I write. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. Oh, do we have? <laughs> I'm happy to answer more questions. Follow-up question right there. Yeah. Can you give some examples of things you've discovered that you weren't going to write about ahead of time? Oh, that's a great question. No, I was just saying that. Um, <laughs> um, no, no, really, I, I know that I have. Um, often it's on a sentence-by-sentence -sentence basis. Um, but you know, there are things like, for instance, in the first Mysterious Benedict Society, I, it started with these riddles that were occurring to me, and I, I finally strung those together thinking, oh, it would be an interesting story if there are these strange challenges that talented kids would have to circumvent or overcome in some way, and it would mean what? And I realized, before I started writing the book, oh, they're, they're being recruited for some mission that only talented kids could accomplish. Um, but I really, for some time, I only thought of three kids and then for a variety of reasons, the more I sat with those three kids, the more I felt like there was something missing. So um, it, I wasn't originally, I felt like I was kind of set, but then in the process of thinking about them and writing, I realized there needed to be a fourth, a fourth character uh, who caused trouble, basically. <laughs> because you, don't, you can never get together a group of people without somebody being really cranky and causing trouble. And, uh, and I wanted every character in the book to have plenty of challenges. Um, and, ever, and the, team, the, the team members themselves to have as many challenges as possible. So I felt like we were missing some challenges from within the group as well. Um, and then I explored that for a while. And th but things would occur to me. So for, I mean, it actually happened a lot scene by scene in Mysterious Benedict Society because one of the things I set for myself 
as a goal was to have something surprising in every scene. Um, and I, you know, it was the first thing, time I'd written for young readers before. Um, but I thought that it seemed like a goal that would keep me on my toes and would be fun for young readers. Um, and so a lot of things would just sort of pop up. I would think, how is this character going to make a memorable entrance? What's going to make them a distinctive character? What's something that would happen right in the middle of this scene that would be surprising? Of course, then I had to follow up and make sure it would work with the overall story, and a lot of things changed. But so, for instance, Mr. Benedict's narcolepsy, or his particular version of narcolepsy. For those of you who don't know, Mr. Benedict's the man, the sort of genius who brings together all these kids in the first book. And in the, in the first scene in which they're talking to him, he's explaining something to them, he gets emotional, and he falls asleep. And when that occurred to me, I was just thinking, what would be something that would be distinctive and surprising in this moment? Um, I was really struck by that, and I thought that would be a really interesting thing to explore. And the more I thought about it, the more I saw how it could work in the larger plot of the book, and so it stayed. But yeah, that was something that I didn't plan out ahead of time. It was just more what happens in the moment of composing the scene. Thank you. Question here? Thank you. Following uh, on that, it seems to me that part of what you're saying is that you're writing plot-driven uh, fiction in your young adult work, and uh, plot-driven stories work for adults also. So I've wondered if, uh, if maybe the difference has more to do with the voice uh, that you're writing in, that, uh, that you adjust the voice for speaking to a younger audience, but uh, um, you might be doing much the same thing if you were writing, say, science fiction or some kind of adventure story for adults. Uh, well, that, thank you for that. I, I would say that, uh, in particular, this was such a, at the time, it was for me a unique experience. I've been writing for adults my whole adult life, and I didn't really have a strong sense of what my voice was. I wrote a lot of different kinds of things. Um, so I knew that my voice was in whatever I was writing, but I didn't think this is my specific style, per se. Um, with the Mysterious Benedict Society was essentially a strange experiment that took on a life of its own and became this living thing. But I just channeled a voice because I didn't think I had anything to lose. I was doing something I'd never done, and I just gave my per permit myself permission to do whatever I thought would be interesting. Um, and so I just channeled a voice that was my memory of the voice of the old-fashioned adventure books I read when I was a kid, which were already old books. Um, and I didn't go back and try to copy those, the voice from those books. I, I looked at some of those uh, books to see how sophisticated the language was because I wanted to write at a high level for kids uh, and without writing at too sophisticated a level for them. And in the end, I decided I could do whatever I wanted and just see what happened. Um, but so that voice, which is a, a concocted voice, it wasn't really, uh, it didn't feel like the kind of voice that I had been writing in, but it clearly became the voice of this series of books. That was the way that I wrote this. When I wrote subsequent books in the series, then I knew that I wanted it, them to be tonally consistent. Uh, it wasn't hard at all for me to get into that voice again. So clearly, that is some aspect of who I am as a writer. But it also, at the same time, feels a little bit weirdly fabricated because it's it's a somewhat, you know, florid and stilted in some ways, a little bit old-fashioned kind of storytelling voice. Interesting question, though. Thank you. Yes. So for if, if all of you can't hear that question, um, Caitlin, the, um, during the time that I took a break from the series, was there a character that I missed the most and why? Um, that, that's an interesting question. I didn't think about a single character that much. Um, I didn't really think I would ever return to the series, as I said, but uh, I would imagine them as young adults interacting with one another. and. In their own, their, the full blush of competence, I thought would be a really interesting thing to see them doing after years of doing what they've been doing. Um, so, I, I mean, Kate is obviously the most visual character. She, she draws you because she's so dynamic. So, it's, I think she intrudes upon your vision, whatever you're thinking about. Suddenly, Kate is crashing through the window or falling from the sky. Um, so, I probably thought of her falling out of trees and things like that. Um, but uh, I really do think I. I'm doing my best to answer your question, honestly. I think that it was the group. I do think that I thought of them as a unit. 
and I kind of missed that dynamic, even though I didn't think I would ever, uh, I, I, was, I felt like good about where I'd left the series off. Uh, there was a 10-year anniversary edition of the first book that came out, and in the back of it, in 2017, in the back of it, there was sort of additional bonus material, a part of which was the author answering questions about the series, and one of the questions was, do you miss these characters? And I really had not been thinking that I missed them. I still answered questions about them every year um, when I did book events or, or answered letters from kids. Um, so they still seem familiar to me, but for the first time ever, I, in answering that question, I felt a bit of a pang and thought, I do actually, I guess I kind of miss these characters. And so I just started, I really didn't think I was gonna write the book, but I started thinking about them and what they might be up to again more seriously and then it gained traction. Thanks for your question. When you're um, writing anything, whether it be novels or poetry, how do you know when you are done with a work? Is it just a feeling you have, or? It is a feeling that I have. I, just, I was just talking about this with a student in uh, my office last week. Um, I, I know when I am finished with a work, when I uh, can still see all of the flaws in it, but I, am, I, I can't possibly work on it anymore because I'm so sick of it. Um, <laughs> And it really, I mean, that's, uh, that's a very honest answer. I mean, it's true, and, but, but it, and it works out practically speaking. It's not just, oh, I'm tired of this book. I don't want it to be in my face anymore. But if you have to consider what kind of mindset you bring to your project. And you're sitting down to work on something that you're tired of. Um, are you the kind of person, and some writers are, and I'm less so, the kind of person who can access that part of your brain that's still doing really good work, even though that, you know, so much of your brain is fatigued with the story that you've been telling. I'm a writer who, for most of my life, um, I get a lot of joy out of creating, and I love the early stages of a work. The later stages, I it's, it's a little more hit and miss. Some of it's a lot more painful, some of it I really enjoy. Um, but it gets harder and harder the longer, the more time I've spent with it. And I have writer friends who are so disciplined, they don't care that they don't enjoy working on it anymore. You know, they, I, can, I, can, I see them aging by the decade, miserably hammering away at their manuscript to make it better because they're able to access that objective part of their brain that knows what would make it better. But so much about what I do, there's a, there's a degree of warmth and humor that I think has to be more connected to my mood. So it's, um, for me, that's where it is. I think, okay, that's, I'm gonna have to be done with that now. Thank you. Last question? One last question, the best question. How about will you, will, will you join us out in the Trishman lobby and sign some books I'd and be eat delighted. some food? Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Trent. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.